Coming up on Unpacked. What was the moment for you then that you said, I want to commit and be all in? I really didn't like the fact that all the things that we do at the end is just a body into a box, into the crowd. Mm. And so what was it all about? What was it for? Did you and the girlfriend break up or you say we're doing this together? Either you get married mm. or you'd have to separate. A monk who is black. Today's guest is here to share his story that is very unique. Let's unpack. It was in his second year of varsity that Sibusiso Nkhabazi made a decision that would see him choose a path on a road less traveled. He decided to become a monk. Years later, he goes by a new name and is even more devoted to this way of life. Some may be shocked and some may be inspired. This is his story. Let's unpack. Sibusiso, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. But I actually stand under correction because you have a new name. Sibusiso is your birth name. What is your new name? Uh, my name is uh, Savia Sachi Das. Savia Sachi Das. Yes. Why did you get a new name? Um, when one commits to mm. spiritual life, then one accepts a, a guru, a teacher. Mm. And so part of being initiated onto the path is that one is given a name mm. that will connect one to the saints and teachers in that line. And so I was given a name uh, of a prince who was a warrior. So Savya Sachi means one who's ambidextrous. Mm. And the Das is a designation that one is a servant. So, mm. so mm. Savya Sachi Das, yeah. What was life like? before you found the spiritual path. Who was that Subusiso? <laughs> Very um, energetic person mm. uh, who was very social and very outgoing. Also very much interested in uh, life, you know. I firmly believe in love mm. and uh, justice. And I wanted to be happy that mm. I knew. And so, as any young person does, I was, you know, man in the town. Man of the town. Yeah. Out grooving, having a nice young life. Yeah. And um, what was your upbringing like? I was raised uh, in a Christian family. In fact, I grew up being under the care of Ukoko. Mm. And Ukoko is actually a nun, was a mm. nun in the Roman Catholic uh, mission. Mm. And so she raised many of us, you know, in African families, mm. there's a tendency that the children are taken to Goko while mm. parents are trying to fend for better, to, for greener grass. Yeah. 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 So then we were left with her. I was raised with her, grew up uh, as an altar boy running mm. around the, the mission school. Mm. And uh, it was full of just laughter and joy and playing. I was the youngest of the lot. Yeah. And so I was like a pet child to my grandmother. And uh, yeah, it was just full of playing that I remember that. W where were the parents at the time? At the time, uh, my father, he was somewhere. He's a, a father of many. Mm. And so he wasn't really in my immediate family. Mm. My mother had uh, gone to the States mm. to further her studies. I think she was in Michigan at the time. And um, yeah, everyone else around was part of the extended family. Mm -hmm. mm. So at what point um, from your early upbringing did your understanding of religion and spirituality come to being? Because you were obviously raised in quite a mm. Catholic environment. When, when did it dawn on you as to, okay, now I understand what this is about? It just, it never really happened in my uh, Catholic journey. Mm. Um, later on in life, I lived with my aunt and she's a Lutheran mm. and very, very dedicated. So the whole family was a prayer uh, filled family. Mm. We were going to church on Sundays. I was in the choir and I was singing there and I was thinking, mm, 
these songs, if they're the songs we have to sing eternally, I don't know if I want to go to heaven to sing these songs forever. Wow. And what was the reason that that's the case? What, what Were there specific words or were that you were just not enjoying the music? It's, you know, in the choir, you, there's many takes. Mm. And uh, it's not that I was feeling so enthused mm. about the song. So, and just my young mind was thinking, if heaven means singing these types of songs forever, maybe I don't think I really want to go there yet. Mm, mm. But then uh, this kept me really safe and, uh, and sort of guarded. And when I got to tertiary, you know, even before that was a lot of Bob Marley. Mm. And so Bob Marley really started to put some wisdom into my heart. I found in him Christianity coming alive mm. because his music is full of, uh, you know, biblical references. And uh, that it was centered around Jah, which I could understand Jah mm. means God. And also he was very politically aware, socially aware, and a man who gave his heart to try and uplift uh, everyone, and especially mm. people in Africa. So at that point, you know, I would say my spiritual journey, religious journey started to give fruit. Mm, mm, yeah. mm. Do you feel like that was the time you became woke? Yeah, you could say like that, yeah. Mm, then, mm. then I was looking at literature to read, mm. trying to understand the world, and um, seeing the world as, you know, how it functions in terms of how it's packaged for all of us to sort of live our lives in mm. a certain way, you know, from, from birth till death, there's sort of a, a route that's mm. mapped out. And so then to question if I was going to be part of that enterprise mm. and how much of my involvement uh, would mean happiness or, or struggle. I was yeah. wondering, what will I do? Yeah. So when were you introduced to this particular way of life and spiritual awakening? When, when did that even become something that you're like, oh, okay, I see what this is? Yeah, I was walking on campus. Uh, at that campus at Pretoria Technicon. Mm. We had our own movement there. What were you studying at the time? I was studying IT. Mm. Uh, yeah, a major in uh, communications. Mm. And um, I saw a poster. Poster was saying Bhakti Yoga Society. Mm. And the topic was a cure for all diseases. Mm. So I was thinking like these guys are smoking weed like us or they onto something. Mm. And I called my friends because already we had our own movement, uh, African Renaissance Association. Mm. And uh, we were on consciousness development. We we're working with uh, many woke people like mm. uh, Kara Institute. Mm. And so when I saw that, I thought, oh, here's something else that could uh, allow us to understand more about what is this life all about. And um, seeing that poster, I called my friends, and it was at the arts campus of the Pretoria Technicon, so we all flocked there. Hmm. I, I remember when we got there, of course, arts campus, you know, is artsy and full of uh, people who are into alternate lifestyles. We had also our friends there. And uh, when we saw the monks, you know, dressed like me, we literally ran to them because we were thinking, what's wrong with these guys? You know, they must know something that all of us don't know. Otherwise, you know, what's this fashion that they're on? Mm. And uh, we spoke to that monk, who are you? What do you do? Because at that time I'm seeking, mm. you know, practically me and a whole lot of my friends. So he said that we are actually running the Bhakti Yoga program here. I said, okay, that's what we came to do. And um, yeah, we went and had our herbal treatments mm. and uh, proceeded to attend that session. So mm. that's where that first connection with uh, uh, the Bhakti process started. What was it that resonated with you that made you want to find out more? Yeah, when I came in to the session, uh, the person who was doing the session was an Afrikaner uh, gentleman, very mm. tall, rugby type. Mm. And at that time, remember, uh, we're into black consciousness. Mm. And I'm just kind of thinking like, ah, what's this Buddha going to tell me, you know? Mm. Anyway, he's very peaceful. He's got this smile that's just hanging there, gentle 
spoken, and he spoke that uh, we are not this body, we're the soul. Mm. And phew, just light bulb moment for me. We we're already talking about consciousness, but mm. I'd never considered that all of us are actually that conscious spiritual mm. being. Mm. And uh, it made sense. Yes, I didn't really choose this body. Somehow I find myself in this body mm. because I wasn't so comfortable fully in that black consciousness space. Mm. It had a lot of uh, sadness. The white man did us wrong. Mm. You know, the system is doing us wrong. And I was, the white man is the devil. Mm. <laughs> mm. And I was thinking, I know all sorts of wonderful people in every race. And uh, so when he mentioned that we're not this body, but we're the soul, the conscious mm. being, I was like, yes, mm. yes, yes. That was the moment. That was it. That was like, mm. yeah. Mm. So what then happened next in terms of your involvement? Uh, we finished that program. They're vegetarians. I thought that was good. You know, we thought, nice, Ital, you know, coming from that Rasta space. And um, they have also a very nice chant. Mm. We're already coming from that Bob Marley space, chant down Babylon. So mm. they have chanting here. Yeah? So I was introduced to the Hare Krishna mantra. Mm. And we sang, we ate. And they told us they were having a retreat mm. in the Drakensberg. So already, you know, we are these men who want to find wisdom. We thought, yes, to the mountains, we're coming. Mm. So maybe about 20 of our own people from African Renaissance Association came with them. Mm. And uh, I remember when I got there, there was a senior monk. Mm. And uh, we thought, this guy looks like he's been at it for years. You know, he mm. just looked very zen another mm. word. And so there we were taught how to do meditation. Uh, we were introduced to the spiritual philosophy mm. and uh, that also there was a lifestyle, you know, that you could live as a full-on vegetarian for, for developing your consciousness. Mm. Yeah, that retreat uh, was really revolutionary. Yeah. One of the things that happened there, they showed a documentary. Uh, the Beatles. Mm. Uh, so George Harrison, you know, you see the Beatles, they're young, they, they're famous, mm. the girls are practically fainting for mm. them. And here's this one guy, he wants to give that up. He says, this is not it. Mm. I'm not happy with that. So I was sitting there thinking like, uh, I'm not going to try and emulate this. I'd never even. Mm. And if the guy who has all the things we aspire for says it's not over here, happiness. And then he's thinking, I want to become a Hare Krishna. Mm. Uh, I thought better, let me hear what this Hare Krishna is really offering. Yeah, and uh, it was nice. I liked that the founder of the Hare Krishna movement or the person who brought it to the Western world told him, don't give up your music to become a monk in a monastery. Use your music to share the knowledge that is making you happy. Mm. Share the, the, the mantra and uh, encourage people mm. into spirituality. So I thought this is practical. You know? Yeah. Mm. It's not like um, having unrealistic expectations of people. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. What was the moment for you then that you said, I want to commit and be all in? Uh, we were driving back to Pretoria. And uh, I was reading one book, Yoga for the New Millennium. And in that book, again, I saw this Hare Krishna mantra. And uh, it hit me. You know, I told my friend, hey, Bubele, you realize that the whole weekend we've been singing one song. Mm. So on the bus going there, singing into the night, the next day for a hike, singing the same song, mm. back into the night again. And now we're driving back to Pretoria, I can hear it playing on the radio and I'm reading about it in the book. So I thought to myself, this stuff must be spiritual, man. Mm. Otherwise, how do we sing this song? What is it? It's a few words. We didn't get bored, we didn't even realize it's the same song. Mm. So I, I thought I'm going to put some energy into chanting and see mm. where this takes me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, with the other people that you are with as moved as you were? Yes, when we got back to Pretoria, you know, it was just 
you know, bhakti yoga or Krishna consciousness was the thing. Mm. We were, you know, just going there for all their sessions at the campus and at their center in Hatfield. Mm. And um, we got involved more and more and different people, you know, found different things that met their needs. Others found certain challenges. So over time, uh, everyone has remained very positive as a friend. Mm. And maybe a handful are still sort of, you could say, seriously involved. Mm. So explain to our viewers then, what is a monk? And then share with us how and when you became a monk. Well, a monk, I remember when I told my mother I wanted to become a monk. She told me more like a monkey. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> That was my mother. She was not taking you seriously. She thought, what's, what you talk about, monk? <laughs> you know, parents, they know you. <laughs> yes, yes. So a monk is basically uh, someone who lives in a monastery. Yeah. Who is uh, living a life which is guided by some spiritual principles. Mm. Who's trying to culture higher consciousness or is trying to master certain aspects of their being. Mm. And uh, there is a certain... Um, way of living. So different monks in different orders may have particular rules of how they live. But uh, running through monkhood is generally celibacy is one of the things that is mm. there. And the dedication to studying spiritual, religious, uh, metaphysical knowledge. I think many people just in terms of what the media, uh, mainstream media shares of monks as you think uh, Buddhism, mm. you think, uh, you've already said the celibacy, you think mm. a vow of silence. Mm. Uh, what are the misconceptions that are out there and mm. what are the things that are actually completely accurate? Yes, uh, celibacy is accurate. Mm. Uh, I think we even see it in the Catholic school. It used to be the case, I don't yeah. know now. Uh, most people generally think you know a bit of Kung Fu. <laughs> and yes. uh, I guess it's the... In Influence of the Chinese movies. Do you know a bit of Kung Fu? No, not no, Okay, no. just checking. But I use it sometimes, like, you know, <laughs> to people, and <laughs> they think uh, this guy knows yes. it or something. Yes, yes. Um, so meditation, mm. yeah, that, that happens with different styles. This vow of, of silence, different orders have it. Mm. Uh, the order that I'm in, our definition of silence is that to not speak things that are only on the material platform. So if you're speaking about knowledge of that connects to the spiritual essence of life, you're as good as silent because you're silent materially in subject matter that sort of reacts and binds your awareness to the temporary world. That is so deep. I need you to say that again. Because mm. I think what you're saying is like, is so rich and relevant. Please repeat that again. That is like mm. so beautiful. Uh, about the vow of silence. Yes. So silence uh, in our tradition is that if one is not speaking subject matter that is related to the material world and which mm. is temporary, they can speak the whole day about spirituality and that's considered as good as silent because mm. that vibration doesn't bind the consciousness to the temporary world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, would you say a lot of the belief systems um, are connected to seeking out uh, a, a, a more present existence? Is that mm. a, a big part of it? Yes, you could say uh, the core starts at knowing first, who am I? Mm. So that before I, I embark on doing so many things in the world, I must know for whom I'm doing these things. Mm. Mm. For example, you know, if the driver of the car thinks that his welfare is in having the petrol at the mm. filling station. Mm. So that's not good because the driver and the car are different. Mm. And the nourishment of the car and the nourishment of the driver are different. Mm. So in the same way, the soul, the consciousness, me and you, are different from the body in which we are encased. Mm. And so if we pursue things only which are meant for nourishing and maintaining the body and not get nourishment for me, the soul who lives in this mm. body, then I miss the whole point in my endeavors of happiness, satisfaction. Mm. Is, is this a religion? 
It is a religion and it is also a philosophy. Mm -hmm. We say that uh, religion without philosophy is sentiment. Mm. And uh, philosophy without religion is mental speculation. Mm. So at the core, it's religious in that religion means there are rules to upgrade us to a mode which is of goodness, which is mm. beneficial to others, and central is God. Mm. Mm. Philosophy means we get to understand, you know, who is God? What is this world? Who am I? And so it's guided by knowledge. Mm. It's not just a, I believe. Mm. 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 So after you told your mom, you know, I want to be a monk, mm. what, what was it that happened next? Yeah, my mom was a bit upset. I mean... Was it, the, was it the first time you were introducing her to your whole belief system? Yes. So now she's at home in uh, the Northwest. Mm. I'm in Pretoria mm. for school. So all this exploring is going while we are apart. Yes. And then come the holidays, that's when now I express to her what's been going on. Mm. And I am now thinking of taking time off from school and to become a monk. Mm. And so she's a bit confused because, you know, she, parents, they put so much uh, hard work to put us through, you know, mm. education and they have their hopes for our lives. Mm. And then now she's thinking, who has come into the life of this boy mm. who is misleading him to give up his education? He's an intelligent boy, so I'm sure she had ideas of mm. my career. And uh, yeah, it was like a shock, confusion, anger, and concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she said, um, anyway, when you go back to Pretoria, mm, I have to come and find out what is this all about. Because my thinking was that, okay, I'm on campus, I'm doing engineering, maths, and I'm solving for X, and I'm thinking, who made all these equations? Mm. You know? And I don't think that they are solving my direct issues. Mm. And I'm thinking that I can see the people who've, went, who've gone through this path, they are not like ecstatic with joy every day. So this must not have served the purpose of happiness. Mm. And I'm thinking, I want to find out, you know, how to be happy. Mm. But my mother knows, and we, we know in our community, you know, the general gateway to sort of a happy life is an education. Mm, mm, mm. And so I'm also thinking, now if I, if I give this up, uh, will I become a bum? But, but why was it so important to give it up? Could, could you uh, exploring the, uh, you know, the questions that you were asking of yourself mm. of like how to find happiness, could you not do that parallel mm. at the same time? Or could you not almost defer it? Mm. And I'm not saying that, you know, in mm. a way that obviously I understand it's the most important thing in mm. your life at that moment. Mm. But was it not an option? Why was it so important to do it then and there? Exactly my mom's argument. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and it, it made sense, you know. And later on, I also even more broadly understand how they can run parallel. Mm. But now, see, I'm coming from a background where I was already looking at the world and, uh, and hearing from people who've analyzed how the whole machinery works. And, you know, these days they call it, you know, conspiracy theories, mm. Illuminati. But, you know, it's just the way the world is working. Mm. So I already had no faith in the system. Mm. So now I, I, I understood, you know, this spiritual life is going to give me something that death can't take away. Mm. And I already didn't like the fact that all the things that we do at the end is just a body into a box, into the ground. Mm. And so what was it all about? What was it for? Mm. So that thirst uh, to, to solve the actual problem, to get that thing that death can't take mm. was really burning. And and this Hare Krishna chanting was giving me a joy that was just like, even thoughts of future difficulties uh, were like, mm, I'll face it when it comes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But uh, 
Yeah, I would say at the time, yeah, I, I, I made that decision that, okay, I'll take the consequences. So you left school? My second year, yeah. And you said, I'm going to go be a monk. What did that mean you were giving up? Yeah, it meant that my, the lifestyle with my friends, the nightlife, um, it meant, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time, mm. and, you know, everything was good, no problems. We both got into the path. Uh, but I could understand that I was giving up unnecessary suffering. Before unnecessary suffering, just so I understand, mm. did you and the girlfriend break up, or you say we're doing this together? We're doing this together. Okay. We're doing this together. It's to a point where she also uh, wanted to join the monastery. Yes. And so we thought, okay, we'll do that. But then, you know, we both have parents. Mm. And her parents are also now worried, what is this? You're, you're in the monastery. Mm. And they also want her to come back home. Mm. Also in the monastery now, you're staying with also celibate monks. Mm. And you get to understand that if you're thinking long-term celibate life, uh, being a monk, then it would mean um, either you get married mm. or you'd have to separate. Mm. And so I had to bargain with her, like, look, you know, give me maybe five years, let me explore this. And I remember making like vows. I said, uh, I'll, not, I'll never start another relationship, mm. you know. If this doesn't work the way I'm thinking, I'll come back. Mm. And uh, that means it's really meant to be. Mm. So, yeah, so it was really like a tug of war because mm. we're good, you know. But now we can't both explore this path in the same ways. Mm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so that was, yeah, that was a, a painful experience mm. because that's, you realize how attached you are to the other person. What was it you were saying about you were giving up uh, suffering? It was uh, sort of there are certain patterns in my life. You know, we do same things roughly in the weekends mm. and they give us the same type of results. Mm. We're out at night, we, we're cold, we're too intoxicated, we're suffering in these ways, we lose things, we get into fights. Mm. And so some habits that we're holding on, hoping they're going to give a, a different experience. Mm. And now, this life as a monk was giving me opportunity for let go of mm. these habits that haven't been serving you in the ways that you want. Mm. Make an experiment with uh, this way of being and uh, see if you get the same result or something more positive. So what is that graduation, if I could call it that, of you officially becoming mm. a monk? Well, the first part of it is you are practicing and, and uh, doing the meditation and uh, living a life free from, you know, gambling, intoxication, illicit sex, meat. So just to elevate you to a bit of a mode of goodness, mm. then you have to seek a teacher, mm. a guru who can... Uh, initiate you and be a guide and a mentor. Mm. So the first level was that, like maybe within two years, then I, I became a committed member, I was initiated. That's when I got the name uh, Savya Sachitas. So in this time, I mean, where are you living? How are you surviving financially? I'm living at the Hatfield Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Corner Church and Duncan at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's a commune. I'm mm. living with many uh, persons. And uh, food, lights, water, everything is supplied by the monastery. Mm. And uh, because, you know, you've got the same style, mm. you know, you've got a few sets of this mm. uh, dhoti and shirt. So you don't, you don't really need so much money. Mm. So it becomes a situation where, uh, you know, mother's concerned, she'll send a few hundred rands every now and then to you just to keep you going. And then also people in the congregation, uh, you know, get concerned. Here's something, you can buy yourself some new socks or something. But 
it, the lifestyle is so simple that you realize actually you, you don't, don't need, need much. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I can understand how that's the case. So basically your days would be spent with meditation, I'm assuming time with your guru, or, or going through um, um, classes, if I could call it that. Yes, yes. It was mainly you classes, uh, some meditation in the morning, and then in the day, different activities are there. So I got involved again with uh, what's known as street chanting. Mm -hmm. So I'm in Pretoria now. I'm in the streets of Pretoria, having been the type of guy I was. Now I'm in these robes mm. and I'm singing in the streets. And sometimes I'm distributing books, selling books to people. Mm. So I'm part of basically the propagation team. Mm. And people would meet me like, hey, it's boo. And then now you're selling books, Joe. Or, mm. uh, but it helped me to quickly accept that now I was part of this lifestyle mm. and um, gave me the courage to share what I'd found with others. So it was that, street chanting, distributing books, selling books on uh, mm. different streets. And I was assisting the team that teaches this at the campuses, just mm. like where I'd met them. Mm. 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 Um, so once the graduation had happened, after the two years you got your name, mm. what was life like? Is this now you being officially a monk? This is still sort of, yes, yes, student monk. Yes. Yeah. So now life is, you've got your duties at the temple as far as cleaning. You are, your duties in terms of uh, worship, in terms of studies, mm. and then also outreach. Then I was attached to a senior monk. Then we start to travel around South Africa. I'm assisting him. He does the teachings. Mm -hmm. And then it started to be Southern Africa. And uh, yeah, you meet your friends sometimes at the malls mm -hmm. when you're selling books or you see them while you're out singing and dancing, mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Sometimes family members see you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just, you, you kind of watch uh, like a run of how you were living. Mm -hmm. uh, Is there a part of you, I, I, I know and I can assume that um, your belief system doesn't have any type of judgment in it. But is there a part of you that looks back at your old life and, you know, sees it in a not so nice way? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, did you judge yourself? I did. Mm. I, I did, but not too harshly. Mm. But I could see the error of my ways and mm. I could now understand I didn't know better. Mm. And so I found myself over the years, when I meet people, I feel... I, I wronged due mm. to just not being aware. Uh, I, I tried to apologize to them and sort of, you know, express and also appreciate people whom I, I now could see. He was my well-wisher, she mm. was my well-wisher, but that time I didn't see that. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So are you still in that area in Hatfield? Are you still at the same monastery or have you now moved to a different home base? Oh, I, yeah, I've moved, I've moved. Um, I, I, I sort of moved out of Pretoria in maybe 06. Mm. I started traveling more. Then I started a base in Eswatini. Mm. I was there for maybe three years. Mm. Then in 2012, I was in Mafikeng for mm. a bit. Then I lived in Durban for a year. Mm. Uh, then I was in India, living mm. there maybe six months. And uh, then I was in Rivonia. Mm. Uh, servicing Vitz University UJ from there in yeah 2018 to mm. and then now I'm in Melville mm, mm, yeah mm. that's my base so you've now been doing this for how many years this is my 20th year 20th year yeah. are there many black monks um, in the monasteries or in the areas that you operate in not not enough mm. there's a, there's a few of us what we get though is um, a lot of um, short term stints, you know, people stay with us six months, a year, two years, uh, sometimes even up to five. And then when they feel strong enough, they, they go back out or they get married or they take up a career. Uh, but those who sort of stay, you know, years and years are a fewer. Yeah. What are your intentions? Do you hope to get married and are you allowed to get married in the level that you are at? No, I, 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 I retired 
uh, from the idea many years ago. Mm-mm. From the idea of getting married? Yeah. So yeah. the poor girl is waiting 20 years on for your answer. <laughs> I think she, 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 yeah, she gets certain situations for her. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I hope she's not waiting. Ooh, girl, I hope you're not waiting. Okay, cool. So, she, so that part of your life, you've decided you are not doing that. You don't feel like you need companionship of that nature. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I've seen it. I, I know its benefits mm. and uh, I respect it. But I, I know personally that I couldn't be that person who can make that person happy. And I found that they couldn't really make me happy mm. the way I wanted to. But I find with, with Krishna, with God, I can give my heart fully. He can kick it, he can hug it. It's always good with me. You know, I can work with that. And you, since that time, you know, committed to celibacy, mm. um, have you broken it or this is just the path that you're continuing? It's, you know, as a young student, it's, it's tough to get the motor going mm. and uh, the, the body works because it, it just works how it works. Yeah. And then later on, it becomes psychological. Yeah. You have to deal with how you deal with the opposite sex. Mm. And then becomes that by doing this type of work, then somehow or the other, also you, then you attract mm. that energy. And now to again resist when people are saying, you are wonderful, you should probably marry me. Mm. And to see that it's not my service to just uh, mm. stick with just one person I'm trying to deal with, a bigger mm. family. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so celibacy, a lot of it is your environment, uh, externally, how you deal with the opposite sex, and also your knowledge. Uh, the body will present its ideas and, and your memory will present mm. ideas, but you learn how to work with that. How do you deal with temptation, just in general, be it, you know, maybe missing alcohol, missing the holy herb? Mm. Uh, missing engaging and and getting into entanglements with women. How do you mm. deal with that temptation? The good fortune in my, my life is that I'm very much involved with uh, the world, so to say. Like sometimes we're at, we're at Opikopi, mm. or it's Woodstock, or it's Bushfire. Mm. Um, we're at Vitz or UJ. Mm. So you, you get to see what's on offer. Mm. And then you can get to see how it's a little, you know, a little diminished in what mm. it's offering. Mm. And so, yeah, and, and I think being a monk dressed the part, it creates a, a nice cushion between you and mm. others that, you know, people don't just rush into your space. So even if there could be some temptation, there's a distance. Do, do you cover. feel like people respect you when they see you because of how you're dressed? Some do, yeah. Some and, and, and others just, they think what's going on here. Mm, mm. Yeah, but what's good is that uh, the way I'm dressed allows people to sort of uh, interact and in terms of trying to question. Yeah, in Africa, people, they can see this is related to a church, so mm. people generally are respectful about that, yeah. Mm. Um, have you found any similarities between uh, the African culture and the kind of life that you're living now? Yeah, yeah, in, in mm. very many ways. Um, it's basically, it's very similar in that the whole lifestyle is centered on respect. Mm. How to respect others, how to respect your body, how to respect your mind, how to respect the forefathers, how to respect God. Uh, and so the plants, the animals. Mm. So from that perspective, you know, it's really about respect. And the highest respect is the main focus, that if one is able to respect God and, and come to sort of love God, mm. then one can respect and love his parts and parcels, his whole creation. Mm. Mm. Um, what does the family say now? What does mom say now about your life? Yeah, my, ma- my mother says, 
Uh, she actually interviewed me at some point. We sat down, you know, one Christmas. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I, I almost had a meltdown, you know, when you did that. Uh, and sort of, but because she's a faithful person, she's a, a, a Catholic still, she said, I prayed to God that my Lord, I cannot do much about this. It's in your hands. If it's good for him, you'll keep him there. If it's not, you'll get him out of there. Mm. And so she had given it to God. And she says now that, you know, I, I have no complaints about your life. Actually, I'm very happy that you took this path. And uh, I wish I knew then uh, how it would really be such a wonderful thing for you. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the family, they call me Uncle Krishna, the mm. kids. <laughs> mm. And it's uh, everyone is... Uh, is, is nice about it, you know, mm. diet, everyone's always concerned. So what you gonna eat because you don't eat this and that. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's worked out nice. Did you ever go back to school and finish? I did at some point, uh, you know, because also in the monasteries when people are transitioning, mm. so certain uh, seniors were going towards marriage or, you know, mm. And they would advise me, look, you're young, your parents are still willing to fund your education. Maybe you should do that so that you have something to fall back on. My mother also, she always kept mm. asking. So then I, I, I signed up at UNISA mm. to do comparative religious studies. Mm. I think I did one or two assignments and they gave me some mark that was just not satisfying on an essay, which I thought I really did well. And then I thought, like, ah, here, and then you we, here we go again, you know. I, my mother was like, so I see, so again. <laughs> <laughs> but now you are living in, in, in a part of what you were studying. You are living the yeah. life. Okay. Yeah. So the schoolwork can, can wait for now. Yeah, I think okay. I took, yeah, school of life. You know? Okay, okay. Mm. What would you like viewers that are watching to know about you and the life that you live? Uh, that... Actually, we, we have needs, all of us. Mm -hmm. Material needs are very well advertised for us and we know them. We also have spiritual needs mm -hmm. and that we should not deprive ourselves of those needs. We should pursue those needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, without pursuing and trying to fulfill your spiritual needs, then you become like that driver who doesn't know if the petrol is for the car or for himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. So we have to nourish ourselves. And that nourishment is in this relationship with the Supreme Person. He may be known in different names, in different traditions. But without deeply pursuing that relationship, we'll always just be feeling not satisfied. Mm. You know, There's, It's never going to hit the spot, whatever it is that we're looking for. Mm. Sibusiso, a.k.a., help me with the name again. Savia Sachi. Savia Sachi does. Uh. Does. Savia Sachi does. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. I really appreciate you sharing such a unique journey and, and, and life experience. It's truly beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And just before going, I'll share the most wonderful thing that I have with the viewers, mm. which is this Hare Krishna mantra. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. These are names of God. So it said, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So you try mantra meditation, see what it does for you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so for much. having me. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Hashtag unpacked with Rile Bukhile. A black monk who would have thought, and we get to have this beautiful experience today with as he was born, Sibusiso. And I'm so fascinated that, you know, it doesn't matter actually whether you're black or white, it doesn't matter whether you're African, you're going to follow the path that connects to your particular faith and your particular belief system. But all in all of it, man, there is something bigger than us that is governing. And don't forget not just to feed your materialistic needs, but also your spiritual needs and to feed your soul. Thank you so much for joining us. Engage with us on the socials. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. Hekibuwa sometimes he could put finger in my vagina. Abatlo checka if akarubala leban na baba huna. Wow. Yo, kitla shapiwa a lot. What's happening? I don't know. I remove the takuba checka kern.
Thank you so much for watching Unpacked with Rilip Khile Mamoja. Make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.